This is Jim Bish with the Americans in Wartime Museum. Today's date is March 29, 2019, and I'm con conducting an interview with George Bershide in um, Sun City, Arizona. George, could you please give me your full name and where you were born? My full name is George Henry Bershide. I was born in Kimball, South Dakota. Okay. And what war did you uh, participate in? I was in the Korean conflict. Did you um, grow up in Kimball then, Kimball, South Dakota? No, I mean, we left uh, South Dakota and I was in the second grade and part of the great migration that came west and settled in the state of Washington. Okay. What part of Washington did you settle in? I uh, yeah, went through grade school in the Port Orchard, Washington. Uh, my dad worked in the shipyards at Bremerton during World War II as a uh, coppersmith. And then after um, the war was over, we moved over to Spokane, Washington, and I finished high school in Spokane. Okay. So you probably were influenced a lot with your with World War II and your father working there growing up. Yeah, so we, we had an anti-aircraft gun emplacement right alongside our school, and uh, we were always in contact with servicemen of all kinds. Yeah, that's a little different, because yeah. being on the West Coast, you would have had anti-aircraft and, and things like that in the Midwest wasn't seen as much, but along yes. the coastal areas it was. We had blackout curtains, we had uh, barrage balloons, uh, searchlights, it was uh, uh -huh. pretty active around the uh, naval installation there. Yeah. So you graduated from Spokane, um, did you, how did you find your way into military service? Well I actually was uh, in a little high school uh, in the valley outside of Spokane, I only had a hundred kids in uh, high school, mm -hmm. uh, my coach in high school was in the Naval Reserve at the uh, air station at Spokane and uh, we were all draftable at that time and so he talked us into joining the Naval Reserve and uh, that way we wouldn't be drafted. Uh, we would still have an, an obligation right. mm -hmm. but uh, we would at least be able to choose where we, what service we wanted. You had your foot in the door a little bit so yes. opportunities yes. were a little better. Um, what year did you graduate? I graduated from high school in 1951. Okay. And um, were you in the Naval Reserve your senior year, or was it after you graduated that you were placed in the Naval Reserve? Well, I, I studied uh, school quite young, and so I turned 17 when I was a senior in high school, and you had to be 17, so the last half of my uh, senior year in high school, I was in the Naval Reserve. Okay. And when you graduated, what was the process then? Were you continued in the Naval Reserve? Well, and I would have, have an obligation. Yes, I would have continued, but I got a call, and they asked me if I wanted to go on active duty for two years. And uh, just out of high school, I didn't have a job. Uh, we weren't very well-off family, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so I thought I might as well go active for a couple years. And so I was activated and sent to the air station there at Spokane, Washington. Okay. Um, did you go through basics as a reservist before you were? Or? I never went to boot camp. I never went to any school. They just took me aboard base and said, you're now going to be a special devices man, and we're going to train you how to operate link trainers to teach pilots how to fly on instruments. Interesting. And so what did that, what, what, what were you doing then? What was the, how did, was the job and what were some of the details of what you well, were doing? Well, we had one other fellow on base who knew how to uh, operate the flight simulators and he trained me then to um, be able to um, teach pilots how to fly on instruments and how to find their way around uh, and find their way back to a carrier. And uh, they were recalling a lot of pilots at that time from World War II. Mm -hmm. They were bringing them aboard base for 30 days, and they each had to have seven hours of flight simulator training. And so we were doing that, and they would be sent over to uh, some aircraft carrier in the Korean conflict. Mm -hmm. So you were, just to help me understand a little bit, um, were, you, were you aiding in the um, simulators themselves as far as keeping them up to date and programmed or yes. were you doing any of the I assume you never were in an airplane um, or were you up to that point? Well we would uh, go on test rides with the pilots to see what was uh, how they were being trained mm -hmm. uh, in actual flight combat or not combat just flight yeah. around Spokane 
And so we, I did get up in the plane a few times, but it was never in uh, any kind of conflict. Yeah. And so we were taught to do maintenance and repair and to operate and give instruction on the flight simulators. Interesting. Um, how long were you doing that? I did it for two years. So your entire time you were doing it? My that. entire time. So when I was 19 and a half, they announced one morning that uh, if you were intending to go to college in the fall, you could get out up to 30 days early. And so that evening I was a civilian and I went to the University of Idaho on the GI Bill when I was 19 and a half years old. So you were, um, the war was 1953, it was just ending about that time. Just ending, that's right, yeah. And you were, you were, you had done your two years? Yes, I'd done my two years and uh, when I reported uh, to the um, VA office at the University of Idaho and went in to, uh, they took one look at me and said, uh, you know, being a veteran of the Boy Scouts doesn't count. You have had to been in the service. So I had to bring all my paperwork out to show them I'd actually been in the service for two years. Yeah, 19 is pretty young to have gone <laughs> through the service and have... Yeah, I still couldn't buy a drink. <laughs> yeah. So, um, why University of Idaho? I knew some people uh, that were going to school there, mm -hmm. and uh, so I knew I had to take advantage of the GI Bill. Yeah. Uh, for me, that's one of the greatest pieces of legislation the government of the United States ever passed. Uh -huh. And uh, so I decided that's where I would go. and mm -hmm. uh, studied forestry and uh, graduated in 57 uh, with a bachelor's and 58 with a master's. And federal job or state job after that? I went to work for 32 years for the U.S. Forest Service. Uh -huh. so that, that's good. Um, why the Forest Service? Was there any, I mean, that doesn't seem the connection with the Navy. Was there anything that growing up you just had an had a identification with that you enjoyed? And having grown up as a child in South Dakota, where my dad did not have a job, and I knew the security, mm -hmm. uh, I was more interested in the security of a government job. And, uh, so, so I think that was the strong attraction. And I, I uh, also knew that uh, when I had learned in Forest School that the Forest Service was a very good organization. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so. Were you at one place for a long time, or did you? Um, were you at different um, national uh, forests? I moved around or? quite a bit in both of Washington and Oregon, and I uh, was on four different national forests, mm -hmm. and uh, was a district ranger on the Umatilla National Forest in Walla Walla, Washington, and uh, finished my career in uh, Portland in the regional office. You stayed in the Northwest then? Stayed in, in the Northwest Portland. the entire time. Um, getting back to your um, time during the Korean conflict, uh, was there anything unusual that happened? Was your job pretty much routine for those two years? Was there anything unusual that stuck out that an event or something happened um, within that two-year time frame? Well, they, um, one of the things we had to do, we all had to train on uh, crash fire and rescue uh, equipment for in case of an airplane crash. And um, while I was going through uh, the rescue training, uh, it was my turn to go in and get the pilot out of the dummy aircraft and instead of using a fog spray on me, they used the straight stream and blew my helmet off. <laughs> so, uh, then every hose in the world I sure was on me and they came in and got me, but that was a rather interesting yeah. experience. But, uh, People that witnessed that probably recall <laughs> that story years down the road. Yeah. But um, was that early in your... Um, when you had to go there, or was that near the end of your? No, that was flight? actually early. The uh, uh -huh. we weren't a very large uh, complement. We had Geiger Field, and uh, there was only probably 150 yeah. uh, people on that base. And so, I was on the marching team uh, that was in the Lilac Parade in Spokane, Washington, did those yeah. kinds of things. And yeah. so, but, uh, did um, I'm sure turnover? You were training a new group every 30 days or something yes, like that. Right. Yeah, a lot of different pilots. And it was quite interesting because when you can imagine World War II, they were young and eager pilots, and now they were called back. They had families, they had children, uh, they established themselves in a career. Right. They weren't all that happy to be back. Yeah. And uh, certainly they were going to do their duty. But uh, you could tell they were a different group of people than uh, yeah. the, what the young recruits were. That youthful enthusiasm was it, gone. It had gone away, yes. Um, well, I'm assuming you still had a large number of young people come through as well, new pilots, or was it primary? No, no, these were all recalls. They were all recalls yeah, that you were working the, with. The new pilots, they would go to Pensacola or someplace like that. So you were train. just the, the, 
yes. group that kind of did touch-up training. And these were all uh, prop-driven airplane pilots. So the, the Navy had just come out with the F-9 Panther, which was the uh, jet that we used in Korea on uh, aircraft carriers. And so none of them had trained in those, and so they probably went to jet training school someplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was probably <laughs> very interesting for them, and yeah, <laughs> I can understand. Um, how, um, what was the most difficult part of the training that you felt for those pilots? Was there any aspect of the simulation that was more difficult to pick up than other, than other parts of it? Well, the, the difficult part was that uh, you would uh, you would get a particular pilot in there, and apparently they uh, uh, they're undercover. Of course, you don't you have a canopy over the top of you; you can't see anything that's going on. And you would get a pilot that would just be in a slow turn, and the simulator's going round and round, just like he was circling an airplane. They had. We're not watching their instruments. They, they just had totally lost that skill mm -hmm. of paying attention to what was happening to them. And then they would uh, fail to make their flight, and then they uh, would say, well, the simulator isn't working right, and then they would go get the commanding officer, and then they would come over, and then I'd have to put him in the simulator, give him a flight. He would say, fine, the simulator is working well. Lieutenant, let's get out of here. And so it was... Sometimes a little nerve-wracking when, uh, when yeah. a pilot didn't do well and uh, he didn't assume it was anything to do with his skills. Yeah. Was, um, were there some pilots that purposely didn't want to pass just to... None, none that I could, uh, could tell. tell. I think they were pretty they well were resolved to what they were going to do. Yeah. Like I say, they had just uh, lost their skills. skills. They little different flying an F-8 than flying a John Deere tractor. Plus it had been seven or eight years since <laughs> right. they had flown many of them right. since then. Yeah. Yeah, and the technology had changed tremendously. Um, is there anything in your military service beyond what you'd already mentioned about the GI Bill that has really proved um, beneficial in your later career, in your later life? Any other aspects of your two years in military service? I don't think that there's any doubt in my mind that I have seen a great difference between people who put time in the military and who didn't. Mm -hmm. It has a whole lot to do with being able to take an order, to follow direction. And I think that uh, if it were up to me, we would have universal uh, training mm -hmm. of some kind where you had to have a job uh, where you actually were learning to take orders and carry out duties. Yep. Uh, but I noticed that in my work life and uh, when we were hiring people who had never been in the military and it was a great difference. Yeah, learning the discipline, the routines, yes. all of that. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's I, probably I, very beneficial. In, in the force service, I spent a great many years on a national fire team traveling throughout the West on, on, on working on force fires. And you had to tell people and give them orders and if they didn't follow them, uh, you were putting people in harm's way. Uh, so uh, it, it really came to life and, and that kind of activity. Yeah. yeah. In your fire service career, did, or your um, forest service career, did you um, were you around a number of aircraft, for example, for forest fires at all that your flight simulation might have come in handy for? Well, I spent or a lot of time uh, flying fire patrol, and um, actually I did some flight training on myself, so I was able to fly. Uh, I didn't have a private license, but I could fly an airplane. Mm -hmm. And so we did a lot of fire patrols, spent a lot of hours in helicopters. I wasn't trained in those. But anytime you were on a fire, you had uh, lots of aircraft around, retardant bombers coming yeah. in, and mm -hmm. uh, those kind of things. So. Yeah. Um, has anybody else in your family followed your footsteps? Were you um, associated with anyone else in the military in your family? before you got in or any of your family members after you were in? Uh, both of my uncles uh, were in World War II, one in the Army, one in the uh, Air Force. Uh, my brother uh, was in the Marines. Uh, both of my sons were in the Army, so it uh, was military. So that's, yeah. some of that is rubbed off and yeah, carried yes. through with your family. That, that's good. Um, one last question. If there's, you kind of already mentioned this with your own um, sons, but um, if there is a family member, a great grandchild of yours, for example, and they were watching this interview, what would you have to say to them about your public service and them thinking about going into the military as far as public service? Well, what, would you, what advice would you give them? I, I would give them advice that uh, when they come right out of high school and uh, get into the 
some kind of a branch of the military. Uh, when you get an opportunity to see some places you're never going to see, uh, true, you could be in harm's way. Uh, you don't know where you're going to get sent. I got sent to Spokane, Washington. They might get sent to Afghanistan. You, you just don't know that. But yeah. I really think they should uh, take advantage of that. Um, my one son that was in the Army uh, got sent to Germany, had a marvelous experience, and he also benefited from the schooling that they mm -hmm. provided. He got his degree basically because he'd been in the service. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, lots of kids should be thinking about doing that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your interview today, and thank you for your service. Thank you.